Uh, welcome, everyone. Today's topic is uncertainty visualization in Bayes, and we're lucky to have Matthew Kate from Northwestern joining us. Welcome to the program, Matthew. Thanks. Uh, happy to be here. Excellent. So let's dive right into it. You know, before we get get some some of your background, my first question is, you know, what is uncertainty to you, and why should we bother with it at all? Like, I like certainty. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can you can define uncertainty by what it isn't. This state of not being certain. Certainly, I think you can you can get into more specific definitions if you want than that. But I, th I think as a broad definition, that's a good one. I mean, you get these more specific definitions. People talking about quantifiable uncertainty versus non-quantifiable uncertainty, or probabilistic versus possibilistic. I think I I tend to think of them in two categories. So one is uncertainty that you can quantify in some way, which for me is often in a Bayesian sense in terms of probability, and then uncertainty that is harder to quantify or not quantifiable or sort of qualitative uncertainty, which might be something like, you know, an expert saying something like we just don't know what this model is going to do in this new situation that we haven't seen before. So I, I think both of those things are really important. And one of the reasons I think they're important is because you make better decisions if you do account for that uncertainty. And so that that's really why I think uncertainty is important and why I'm interested in trying to communicate it. The other reason I'm interested in trying to communicate it is because I think about communicating uncertainty to lay audiences. And I'm, I'm really interested in taking complex things and trying to communicate them in ways that people can generally understand. And so that's also what has drawn me to uncertainty communication. I, to be honest, I'm a little puzzled with your fascination with uncertainty, okay? Because you, know, you originally studied computer science at, at the University of Waterloo. You have a master's in math and CS from the same school. Yeah, you have a PhD in computer science and engineering from University of Washington. You know, the formal statistical training is absent from, from that list. And uh, congratulations, by the way, um, <laughs> on that. But... You know, people who study CS are generally not obsessed with uncertainty, right? So how did you stumble upon this research program and what piqued your interest in it originally? That's, that's a really good question. So I started my PhD at the University of Washington broadly interested in human-computer interaction. So this notion of studying how people use computers and how we might make computers better for people. And I was originally working in this sort of like personal health informatics area. We were putting sensors into people's bedrooms, trying to track how they sleep, trying to track factors that might negatively or positively impact their sleep, like light, sound, air quality, things like that. And then we were trying to communicate that information to people in a way that they might take some action to improve their bedroom setup or something like that. Uh, and one of the things that I realized in all of that, and I think my cat's about to join us, um, one of the things that I realized in doing all that was as soon as you get to the point where you're trying to communicate information to people in a way that they can take action, you have to start dealing with the uncertainty in that data because otherwise, you know, you lose trust or you have confusion or misunderstandings. And so that's really what then started to get me to go back and think about uncertainty communication as a problem and, and study it more. I see. So that, that was later, right? Dur during your PhD work, not, not so much when you were doing the uh, undergrad and master's. Uh, right. Yeah. That kind of started um, partly through my PhD. You know, your, your PhD thesis was designing for user facing uncertainty in everyday sensing and prediction. So, w what is the scope of everyday sensing and, and what were some of the key takeaways from, the, from that research? <laughs> bringing up someone's PhD thesis is always an interesting move. <laughs> it wasn't uh, that long ago, right? No, no, it wasn't that long ago. So, yeah, so everyday sensing and prediction to me is, you know, it's it's things that you encounter in everyday life where you need to make some kind of decision. You know, it's, it's deciding if you're going to take an umbrella to go out, if it's going to rain or not. It's you know, the work, work that I've done, which I'm going to talk about briefly at the beginning of the talk in trying to figure out when a bus is going to show up at your bus stop to make some decision about like what bus to take or what mode of transportation to use on the basis of the, of the uncertainty and its arrival time or something like that. It's these decisions that we're just, we're just constantly making all the time that sensing or prediction might help with and can help with, and there are systems that try to help with, but that also often don't communicate uncertainty when they try to do that, which I think they could, and, and that people's decisions would be better if they did. Got it. 
Okay, and, and uh, I have one, one other question for you, and then we'll get started. So, currently, you're, you're a professor in CS and communications at Northwestern, correct? Mm -hmm. So, wh why these two departments, and what are some of the things that you're you're working on now? I I think these two departments because they uh, well match the sort of combination of things that I like to say. So, for, previous to that, for four years, I was an assistant professor in the School of Information at the University of Michigan, which in some ways, it's the combination of those two things, but in one department. <laughs> and now I'm here, sort of 50-50 across two. I mean, I, some of my work is very on the empirical end. We develop new visualization techniques or take existing visualization techniques, apply them to some problem, study people's decision quality in those contexts, for example. Some of my work is more on the technical side. And I'll talk a, a little bit about one of these projects briefly in the talk today, where we're trying to more formally describe a whole set of uncertainty visualizations and then come up with ways of specifying those. And that's certainly more on a technical contribution and more something centered in computer science. I think the bridge between those is being able to take, say, a formal description of an uncertainty visualization and then use that as a way of breaking down the research space to systematically study the impacts of different types of uncertainty visualization on people's understanding or decision making or something like that. So I really do feel like I, I, I sit across those two fields and then try to bring them together in some reasonable way. And so that my current appointment, I think, reflects that very well. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Okay. So let's, uh, let's now transition. Well, I'll, I'll, give you the mountain, so, so to speak. Please, viewers and uh, listeners, if you, ask, uh, if you have questions for Matthew, please type them into the chat. We will go through them at the end. Uh, I think this talk will probably go to approximately 12.45 or so Eastern time, and then we'll do some, some Q&A. So without further ado, it's all yours, Matt. Thanks. But I'd like to start by sort of framing at least one chunk of the sorts of research that I do by this question, which is what kinds of uncertainty visualization should we build? We're sitting now on the eve of the 2020 presidential election, so it's perhaps interesting to reflect on what happened in the 2016 presidential election. Uh, so these are probabilistic predictions of Trump's chance of winning that election. Obviously, he did win it. These are from three different poll aggregators who build statistical models based on polls and uh, you know, sometimes other fundamentals, and then try to give a probabilistic prediction of the chance of each candidate winning the election. So 538 gave him a 28% chance, New York Times a 15% chance, and Huffington Post a 2% chance. Now, the interesting thing is, even this many years later, if you go on Twitter or whatever other social media you have, People will still complain, for example, that 538 made a bad prediction of what the outcome of the 2016 presidential election is going to be. But, of course, if we think about this as a probabilistic prediction, we can't really judge it on the outcome of just one, one sort of contest or one sort of draw from a distribution or what have you. We really have to judge sort of how well calibrated perhaps 538's predictions are over time. When they say something is going to happen with about a third of a chance, does it happen about a third of the time? For 538, that's generally the case approximately. So we can't necessarily say that this is a bad prediction. But I think there's a problem with the way that it's communicated. If you say there's a 28% chance of something happening, people are can be willing to sort of round that down to zero and then be surprised when it does actually happen, even though that's a third of a chance. It's not a bad chance that, that Trump would win. So I'm going to show you a different way of looking at the same information. This is a, something called a risk communication theater. The idea here is I've given you a ticket to a random seat in the theater. I've colored the seats black in proportion to Trump's chance of winning. If you end up in a black seat, Trump wins. If you end up in a white seat, Clinton wins. I hope you'll agree with me here that even though it's just the same information, it feels less surprising to learn that Trump would win the election here than when I just told you there was a 28% chance. And so the point that I'm trying to make here is that people are very good at ignoring uncertainty, but this is especially true when we provide bad uncertainty representations. Risk communication theaters are just examples of icon arrays. They're sometimes used in medical risk communication to communicate, say, potential outcomes from different treatments you might take, something like that. More generally, these are frequency framing or discrete outcome 
visualizations of uncertainty because we call them this because rather than showing, say, continuous probability, we are turning it into something discretized that you can then sort of try to imagine what the possible outcomes could be and how frequent it might be. So one of the things that I've worked on back during my PhD, and this is going back to the, the sort of bus work that I alluded to in our little preamble, is this question of what's an icon array for a continuous distribution? These are discrete distributions. In this case, just two outcomes successfully cured or not. Uh, if we wanted to apply this same sort of approach to try to make a better way of presenting uncertainty to a continuous distribution, how might we do that? So here's an example scenario. These are, this is for a system called One Bus Away uh, back in Seattle uh, when I was doing my PhD. This is just tracks where all the buses are in real time in Seattle and then tries to predict when they're going to show up at the bus stop. So this is telling me here the bus number 120 has a six minute delay. It's going to show up 11 minutes from now. That's what the system predicts. It does have an uncertainty presentation. So down here at the bottom, if I want to read the fine print, bus arrival estimates are based on the best available information, but actual times will vary. Well, this is probably not that useful for me. I'm in Seattle. There's probably about four or five coffee shops uh, within iShot. Do I have time to go get a coffee before my bus gets here? Well, currently the system is telling me something like this. It's giving me, you know, between now zero and off into infinity, your bus is going to show up exactly 11 minutes from now. Obviously, this is an over-precise prediction. GPS systems can be inaccurate in urban areas. You know, the bus driver might hit some traffic. The bus driver might make up time. There's a lot of different things that could happen to change the final arrival time of the bus. So something more realistic might be something like this, a probability distribution over the time to arrive of the bus. In this case, there's a you know, reasonable chance it shows up between five and 10 minutes from now, most likely 11 minutes from now. You may not be able to see it. There is a bit of skew to this distribution. So there is a bit of a longer tail. Maybe the bus shows up even as much as 20 minutes from now. Of course, this isn't what I want to know either, though, because really what I want to know is something like this, which is if I show up at the bus stop eight minutes from now, there's a 90% chance that the bus comes after me, which is the same thing as saying that I catch the bus. You might say that if I was trying to build a user interface for communicating uncertainty in this context, I might report something like this, a one-sided, say, 90% prediction interval for when the bus is going to show up. But the problem is that doesn't really work either because depending on the diff a different person or a different context, your risk preferences are going to change. If this is a really important meeting, maybe that goes up to 99%. You really need to catch that bus in order to get there on time. If it's lunch with friends, maybe it goes down to 75%. Or if you know there's another bus that you could catch instead of this bus. And so what I really want to be able to do is communicate this entire distribution to people in a way that allows them to apply their risk preferences in the moment to make a decision that's sort of best for them. So one thing that you might do is say, well, just give them this density plot. And now you run into a different problem. Normally, I do this part interactively, but I think I won't ask Eric to come on to do this. But I'll ask you to imagine. How large do you think the smaller circle is as a proportion of that total outer circle? Now just take a second to think about that, but don't take too long. I just want your sort of initial quick response as my cat jumps away. Okay. So most people, when you ask them this question, will answer something between something around about 80 or 85 percent, you know, plus or minus 5 percent. The actual answer here is 75 percent. The smaller circle is 75 percent uh, the area of the larger outer circle. The reason this happens is that area perception in humans is biased. Uh, as things get larger, we don't perceive them as being relatively as large as they, they actually are. Um, as a result, you don't see the larger outer circle as being as big as you should, so you think the smaller circle is a larger proportion of it than it is. So the point here is that we can use some knowledge of human perception to think about how we might redesign this uncertainty visualization so that people could apply their own risk preferences, but in a way that's less biased. So one thing we could do is just take the integral of this. So we could use the cumulative distribution function, which is going to tell me, say, at 10 minutes, there's a 25% chance that the bus comes before me, which is the same thing as the area sort of under the curve to the left of 10 as a proportion of the full area. 
that might be one way of doing this. Although the other thing that I said kind of earlier on was I wanted to, to come up with some notion of an icon array, some analog of that for a continuous distribution. So another thing that I could do is take evenly spaced probabilities uh, here, 20 of them, and then project them back into time and stack them up into something called a dot plot. This representation is now getting at that frequency framing approach to uncertainty communication. Uh, also has some other nice properties. So the first one is uh, essentially counting now allows you to do interval estimation down to the resolution of the dot plot. So here, if I get to the bus stop eight minutes from now, I miss two out of 20 of these hypothetical buses, or I catch 18 out of 20 of them. And so that means that I have a 90% chance of catching the bus. The nice thing about this is this type of interval estimation is actually fairly fast and accurate for humans as long as you're doing estimates of the tails and as long as the denominator of the dot plots, the number of dots in the dot plot is relatively low. The reason for that is there's a thing we can do called supertizing, which is that we can immediately recognize the number of elements in a collection up to about five-ish elements without having to sit there and count them. Which means that if I'm really interested in these sort of tail estimates, it's actually pretty quick and easy for me to find where those are if the resolution of the dot plot is tuned to the particular task or the domain, you know, if I know something about the, the levels of uh, risk that people want to are willing to tolerate in this particular domain, where they might want to sort of draw that line, I could pick the denominator of the dot plot to try to match that, depending on the uncertainty that's there. So we run some studies on this kind of thing, and I'm not going to get too far into the details of it. We run, we run an incentivized study where we, you know, put people into a bus catching scenario. We give them payouts for different things like the amount of time at the bus stop versus getting to the meeting on time, that sort of thing. And we see that they're able to make better decisions in terms of the rational utility standard compared to other uncertainty representations like density plots or intervals or other sorts of things you would normally see. But the general idea here that I'm trying to, to sort of suggest is that you can use a combination of these three things to design more effective uncertainty visualizations. The requirements of the task, so here that people want to make these one-sided interval estimates, visualization perception, so knowing things like the bias of area estimation, and uncertainty cognition, so, so taking this frequency framing approach to an uncertainty visualization design to design a more effective uncertainty visualization. One of the things that I thought was really interesting now in 2020 is 538. And if you're currently panicking that uh, 29 and 100, I took this screenshot a couple of weeks ago, is now like 12 or 13 or 14 or something like that. The, the nice thing is 538's redesign of their visualizations this year is actually using this kind of approach to communicate the uncertainty in the final number of electoral votes. And I have it on reasonably good authority from some people who know some people at 538, so take that for what it is, that they were actually influenced by this work on quantile dot plots. So that's kind of cool. I want to give a couple of other examples of uncertainty communication and, and really to highlight some of the other ways that it can go wrong and some of the other approaches that might be useful. Probably all of you have seen a hurricane error cone before. Usually, uh, depending on who's Putting the error cone together is usually either a 66% or a 95% predictive band around where the center of the hurricane will be or where it's predicted to be. Now, one of the problems with hurricane error cones that comes up is something called a deterministic and screwal error, which is a, a type of error that people sometimes make when interpreting uncertainty visualizations. Usually, most of the studies I've seen that have studied these, it usually finds like around 30% of people are making this error, type of error. The error is a misinterpretation of something in the visualization that's trying to communicate uncertainty as trying to communicate something deterministic about the forecast. So in the hurricane error cone example, you get a proportion of people who will misinterpret the error cone as being the predicted size of the hurricane and not a predictive band around the center of the hurricane, which is, you know, a potentially large misinterpretation, especially once the hurricane, you know, makes landfall, it starts to become smaller. One way of mitigating against this is to use something called a spaghetti plot. 
simply because it looks like a bunch of noodles. Where rather than trying to communicate predictive band, you take a bunch of draws from an ensemble and then you draw a bunch of these different predicted paths. So now you have a distribution of, of potential paths that the hurricane could take. And it's a lot clearer that what you're talking about with each sort of noodle or each spaghetti is where the center of the hurricane is and not what the size of the hurricane is. So we can apply these same sorts of uncertainty visualizations to everyday statistical models. So here's just a really simple linear regression. You could do a spaghetti plot with a linear regression. You could also do something called a hypothetical outcome plot. And this is just the idea of, it's kind of a cute name because it shortens to hops and you see it hop around. This is something that a collaborator of mine, Jessica Hellman, has done a lot of work with. And the general idea here is you take draws from, say, a posterior distribution or an ensemble or a sampling distribution or however you're, you're constructing your uncertainty, and then you animate over them. And essentially, you force people to experience the uncertainty in what this, say, this model uh, might think. I kind of like to think about this as, you know, I show this to a researcher and I'm going to say, I'm going to stop this animation on a random frame. How much do you want to bet your research question comes out the way that you think it, the way that you want it to? So there's another piece to this, which is that building effective, complex, and correct uncertainty visualizations is hard. So besides all the stuff I've already talked about in terms of looking at task requirements, looking at visualization perception, looking at uncertainty cognition, to understand what you should build in the first place, there's also just the question of how you actually build that thing. One of the other pieces of work that I, I'm really interested in is building tools to help people do this sort of thing. I think it's really important in visualization in general and uncertainty visualization in particular to be able to rapidly iterate over possible visualization designs, test those out, see how people understand them, quickly change to something else if it doesn't seem to be working. You can't do that if every single visualization you want to create requires you to write, say, 200 lines of D3 code, which if you've ever used D3, it's a visualization library for the web, is very, very powerful, but also can be hard to sort of quickly change from one visualization type to another. You have to rewrite a lot of things. And if you're trying to do this with an interactive visualization, it can be difficult. But even if you're doing a static visualization, it can be a real pain to, to just build these things in the first place. And you want that friction to be really low so that designers can try a lot of things. If you think about it from like an optimization perspective, you don't want to just like start in one point of the design space and then just kind of go like this and then come up with you found after a little bit of rounds of iteration. You want to try a lot of different points across the design space so that you don't sort of get stuck in a local maximum. There's kind of two ways that I've been tackling this lately more on the kind of tool building software side. One is building R packages to take output from Bayesian models, things like STAN, help people quickly construct uncertainty visualizations from that. So I have two packages in that vein, uh, TidyBase and GGDist. I'm going to talk briefly about one sort of approach that I've used in that package, in those, those pairs of packages to help people build and iterate on different types of uncertainty visualizations. So if you aren't a STAN user, this part of the talk might lose you a little bit, but bear with me, it's only going to be about five minutes and then we'll come back to other stuff. So TidyBase and GGDist essentially provide primitives for constructing uncertainty visualizations and then also functions for taking the output of Bayesian samplers and then munging them into data tables that are easy to input into visualization systems like ggplot, which is a library in R for constructing visualizations. The general strategy that I apply to uncertainty visualization construction is something I call grid, condition, munge, maybe, and then plot. Uh, and so most of the ways that you, I think, can effectively construct most of the uncertainty visualizations you might want to from something like Stan fall into this pattern. And if you follow this pattern, it becomes a lot easier to construct good uncertainty visualizations. So here's an example. I'll sort of try to walk through and give you a sense of this pattern and how you can apply it to construct uncertainty visualizations. So here's a visualization I want in the end. It's just a 
from a linear regression. This is the BRM package in R. It's just saying I want Y as my response variable and X as my predictor. They're both continuous, and I'm just doing a linear regression. And what I want to be able to visualize here at the end is this regression fit line with 95% and 66% credible band around it. So the first step I'm going to do is grid. And really all that is is I want to take some grid over the predictors in my model. In this case, I want to take all combinations of my predictors. It's kind of not that interesting because I only have one predictor here. But in general, you can use this expand function to take a set of predictors and get all combinations of values of that predictor. And then I'm just saying I want evenly spaced val 25 evenly spaced values in the domain of x that I'm going to use to make predictions at so that I can construct this fit line and its uncertainty. In this case, the output is not that interesting. It's just a data frame or a data table with 25 rows from 1 up to 10 for values of x. Then I'm going to do the condition step, which in this case is using a function from tidybase called add to the draws. The general idea here is that for every row in this input table, I want to take draws from the mean conditional on those predictors. So in this case, I'm taking draws from the mean of y as predicted by the model, conditional on x. And this turns it into a very long, long format data table where each row here has turned into, say, you have 5,000 draws in your model, then you get 5,000 rows per input row of your, of your data grid. And then the last thing that I want to do before I start plotting this is to actually summarize this down into intervals. Tidybase package provides these functions for doing that. One of those is called median QI. So this gives me the median quantile interval of some variable in my data frame. So in this case, I'm getting the median and quantile interval of this value column, which again is the mean conditional on X. And it just turns it into this data table where I have lower, upper, and width columns. Now, given this, I'm almost the way there to what I want. So I want a 95% and 66% credible band. And right now, I just have the 95% band. The nice thing about median QI is it's really designed for outputting these long format data tables. And if I just specify that I want two different widths here, so 66% and a 95% uh, credible band, it will just add an extra row for each of these groups in the uh, input data table so that I now have 66% and 95% bands for each of these x values. And then it just remains for me to plot this thing. So in ggplot, if you're not familiar with it, the general idea is you are mapping variables from your data table onto what ggplot calls aesthetics, or more generally in visualization terms, we think of as visual channels, basically like things that you can see, right? Position, area, color, that sort of thing. And so here I'm just saying, well, I want the x position to be my x variable. I want the y position to be that value column, which again is the mean conditional on x. In this case, it's actually the median of distribution for the mean conditional on x. I want the excuse me, the y min, which is going to be the lower end of that band, to be the lower end of the credible interval, and y max to be the upper end of that interval. And then I use the line ribbon geom, which is a geometries in ggplot are just ways of putting together marks on the screen based on what these aesthetics are. And so this line ribbon is just saying, what the line ribbon does is it takes the value, it plots it as the line, it takes the lower and upper ends, plots it as the interval, and then it also automatically pulls in this width column and turns it into the color of the two different bands. And so this is enough for me to get from the data that I had and the model that I had all the way to this line ribbon chart. And you might think that this is kind of a bit of a really complex way of building this kind of chart. Like, why wouldn't I just make a single function that does this? And the reason for that is 
what you want to be able to do again with this rapid prototyping thing is you don't want to be restricted by just the functions that have been come up with. And you don't want to have to reformat your data every time you try to make a new uncertainty visualization. And so this approach, as I'm going to show you in a minute, will allow us to rapidly iterate through different types of uncertainty visualizations without having to reshape our data a whole bunch in between those steps. And in a way where if we really wanted to, we could start combining these things together, put multiple ones on the same plot, um, map other variables onto these aesthetics. Maybe I want multiple line ribbons with different colors for different models or something like that. And I can do that very easily in this context where if I just had a single function that did all this together, it'd be very hard to sort of tweak those knobs. The other thing is I don't actually really want to do this last step all the time, the step where I'm doing the summarization. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use something called stat line ribbon, which essentially just does that under the hood. I can provide this width information if I want to. So here I've actually changed it to 50, 80, and 95% intervals, and I get 50, 80, and 95% intervals uh, here so that I don't have to kind of stick that last step of, of doing the summarization manually. The reason for that is a lot of the other types of visualizations I'm going to show don't use that summarization step. And so I, I don't want to have to push, put that in or pull it out constantly. I want to be able to just change on the visualization side what, I, what I'm going to show. So the code for this is relatively straightforward and, and reads exactly kind of as these grid condition plot steps. So I expand my initial data table to my the predictions I want to make predictions at. I populate that with draws from the mean conditional on those predictors. And then I use a line ribbon to display them. There's a couple of extra other lines that aren't really relevant, which are just adding on the points from the original data and choosing the color scheme uh, instead of the default color scheme, which is kind of ugly. But let's say I wanted draws from y conditional on x, I wanted a posterior predictive distribution. Well, all I have to do is swap out this line where I was doing add fitted draws to add predicted draws, and then change this one variable name. Or let's say that I did still want to look at the mean conditional on x, but I wanted to do something more on a frequency framing end, because I've just been talking earlier in the talk about how that's a good idea. So why not do like a spaghetti plot? That's actually pretty easy too. So I'm still just taking draws from the mean conditional on x, I'm subsetting them down to only 100 because I, if I tried to put like 4,000 lines on this plot, you wouldn't really see it as a spaghetti plot anymore. They'd just blur together. And then I'm just using a line geometry to draw each one of those lines. So the idea, and so again, the idea here is I don't have to keep changing out my data structure in order to draw these different types of visualizations. I might also say, well, what I really want is a hops plot. I want to be able to have people experience this uncertainty. So I can do that too. I can add on some code for doing these. Uh, I, can, I can use the ggAnimate package, which allows me to essentially say, draw a different chart for every value of draw in the data table. And then it will put together an animation for me, which just iterates over all of those values of draw and then shows the different frames. So the general idea here is that this structure allows me to quickly iterate over different types of visualizations for the same data, including a bunch of things that you know I haven't even talked about here, or ideally that I haven't even come up with that users can look at and sort of play with and then try to come up with an effective uncertainty visualization for their context. So here's a couple of examples of things that I've built, and there's you know, a bunch of people out there using this now, building other things that I've never even thought of in the first place. And that's really where I think that the power of this approach comes, is coming up with a data structure that you can use to build a bunch of different uncertainty visualizations and really rapidly explore that design space. So one of the other things in that family, so GGDIS and TidyBase are kind of sister packages, is the slab interval family, which is a bunch of essentially visualization primitives for doing different types of uncertainty visualizations that are flexible enough that you can apply them in different ways. So this example in the middle is just using what I call I plots, which are a combination of densities and intervals, and then showing a region of practical equivalence by 
mapping a color aesthetic onto the, the fill color of these densities. And this is like, a, you know, half a line of code modification from the normal version of this particular geometry. Okay, so I said I'm tackling this problem of building effective complex uncertainty visualizations on multiple fronts. So one of them is this tidy based GGDIS package. Another one is something called the probabilistic grammar of graphics that my PhD student Xiaoying has been working on. So I'm going to talk briefly about that. The general idea here was to take a bunch of different types of uncertainty visualizations from the literature, from, from data journalists, and then try to understand them systematically so that we can specify them systematically. Now, one of the problems with the grammar of graphics, as far as visualizing densities is concerned, is that there are certain things you can do that will actually turn out to be wrong. And one of the things we wanted to do in this project was make it so that you could specify uncertainty visualizations in a way that it would try to help guarantee correctness in a certain sense. So here, this is the infamous empty cars, motor trends, car data set. It's one of the data sets that is, for inexplicable reasons, automatically loaded in your session when you start up R. On the x-axis here, I just have miles per gallon of some different cars. And then this is a density plot. and I've tried to color, split up the density into a stack density that's colored by the number of cylinders in the engine of each car. And this is sort of the naive version of how you would specify this visualization and how you would expect the output to be what I just described. Unfortunately, this plot, as it turns out, is wrong. So you would expect, for example, to be able to make estimates like in this sort of slice, What's the chance of getting a, what's the, the, you know, chance of there being a car that has about 19 miles per gallon? Or in this whole slice, given cars with around 20 miles per gallon, um, what's the chance of there being a car that has six cylinders in its engine? Um, neither of these estimates that you would expect to be able to make from this visualization are actually correct because one of the things that ggplot doesn't know anything about is conditional probability, and it doesn't correctly normalize these densities. Each of these three separate densities has the same area, even though there are different numbers of cars in uh, with these different numbers of cylinders. So the correct plot actually looks like this. And you essentially have to manually do this normalization in order to get the correct plot. And then these questions you would actually be able to visually answer correctly. So the thing that we realized was, well, if these are the things you're actually trying to say with a plot, you want the density for miles per gallon, and you want in the color regions, these areas to reflect probabilities of cylinders conditional on dense miles per gallon, why not write those things directly into the specification? So we came up with a way of essentially recursively subdividing densities based on specifications of conditional probabilities like this, such that they're guaranteed to reflect those conditional probabilities in the final visualization. So we have a, this is a more experimental work. Um, it's, whereas tidy bays and GGDIS are really like things that you can adopt and use because they're well tested. This is a package that is more on the research side where we're really trying to understand how do you systematically describe a whole bunch of different certainty visualizations. And this is a, a chart showing just some of the sorts of things that you can create with this. And it's all by mapping these conditional probabilities onto heights and widths and areas of different geometries, and then having the system figure out how you actually construct a visualization to reflect those conditional probabilities. So that's more in the practical side of the stuff that I build and try to get out into the world. I want to end by just going back to election data. Again, because I think it's pertinent, I also think it's interesting. This is the New York Times election needle, the, I should say, infamous New York Times election needle. The idea behind the New York Times election needle was kind of interesting. It's sort of a hypothetical outcome plot. And on the eve of the 2016 election, as the returns were coming in, they were running a model. Their model updated, I think, about every 30 seconds, trying to predict the final vote margin between uh, Trump and Clinton. And then if you were running this in your browser, the model was being updated every 30 seconds, but then the needle was constantly like 
within fractions of a second vibrating within the central 50% interval of their predictive distribution of what the final vote margin would be. So the idea was, it was it's an uncertainty visualization that's trying to you know, make you experience that uncertainty like I was talking about earlier. A lot of people did not like the New York Times election needle. My favorite one of these is down in the, the right-hand corner. The New York Times needle jitter is irresponsible design at best and unethical design at worst, and you should stop looking at it. I actually disagree with this. I think the New York Times election needle made a lot of people anxious, but it made them anxious because they were uncertain about something that they cared about, which was the outcome of this very important election. And if you're uncertain about something that you care about, you probably should be anxious. And so I actually really like the New York Times election needle, although there were so there were other aspects of it that I think were maybe not as good. So the, this other quote up in the top right. Don't look too hard. The bounce is random jitter from your PC, not live data. To me, this actually reflects a deterministic construal error that that I was talking about earlier with the with the uh, hurricane error cones. This person is is not recognizing the fact that the jitter is intended to communicate uncertainty, not to like fake a model update. And so I think that the the needle was a good idea from the perspective of trying to make people experience uncertainty, but where it fell down was they chose a mechanism that people don't necessarily associate with uncertainty. They associate, or at least some people associate a needle with precision measurement, probably much to the chagrin of statisticians who associate the notion of measurement more likely with error than with precision. But this is you know, the reality of how people think about these things. So I was thinking about this for several years afterwards, and I started thinking about Galton boards, right? Like these things that you can use to sort of simulate a distribution by just having a bunch of balls fall down. So here I get a, a binomial distribution, and it also is well approximated by a normal. I think that's a mechanism that people would more readily associate with uncertainty because it's a mechanism that seems random, where a needle maybe associates more with, with precision. And so I started thinking about how would I show predictions for what's going to happen in the election using this kind of approach. And I came up with this thing I call presidential Plinko, which is I basically just take the predictive distributions from these two different poll aggregators here, 538 and The Economist, and then I fit a binomial distribution to those and then use that to determine the height of a Plinko board and then drop balls down the Plinko board uh, to show the different possible outcomes. So that you can actually experience kind of the uncertainty in what the forecasters are suggesting might happen in the election. And you can also, if you really want to, you can just drop one ball and kind of you know, experience what election night might be like if we, you know, trust that these forecasters are doing a good job with their models. The other thing that I'm doing here is I'm actually showing in the bottom a quantile dot plot. So I'm not I'm not actually drawing these at random. What I'm doing is I'm constructing a faithful representation of the distribution and then figuring out paths that could have led to it. So it looks random, but it, the final distribution is actually a faithful representation of the forecasters prediction. So I'm trying to combine those things, that frequency framing, hops, animation, so that people can experience the uncertainty, but so that the final representation also faithfully represents the probabilities um, in a frequency framing manner. And that really just kind of brings me to the end of my talk, where I think that the things that we need to be doing with uncertainty visualization are presenting well-calibrated uncertainty that can't be ignored in ways that people can actually understand. Thanks, Matthew. That was, that, that, that was awesome. Appreciate it. Let me ask a few questions. There, there a couple of questions came in. Anyone else uh, has questions, please type them in to the stage chat. You can also put them into the event chat. We'll see it there as well. So you, you use this term early and they use it again for well-calibrated uncertainty. That's something for people who work in the area that, that, that has a well-defined meaning. Can you maybe explain that term? What, what is a well-calibrated prediction? 
think of it in the sense of one where, you know, when you say something has an X percent chance over for a forecaster, say for that forecaster over their set of predictions that they make, when they say something has an X percent chance, it happens at X percent of the time. You uh, showed some examples of where this uncertainty communication interpretation fails. Do you see like areas where it like fails more often, like the more frequently, more egregiously, like because you work in different sort of different areas, and I suspect it's not uniformly the failure is not uniformly distributed, or is it? I, I don't know. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I think I yeah, I, I mostly find that people have difficulty interpreting uncertainty, and this is, or at, at least when it is poorly communicated, and this is a, apart from people who spend a lot of time thinking about it, like statisticians. I think it's fairly uniformly the case that people have this this problem. I mean, I, I like to joke that, you know, I mean, some of my work lately has been looking at how scientists think about uncertainty when they, you know, write up statistical reports in their own papers. And you would hope that scientists would be experts at this because they they are essentially making decisions under uncertainty all of the time uh, when they interpret their, their research results. And I, I'm not particularly convinced that they are that great at it necessarily. Um, and so <laughs> um, this is this is one of those problems. I mean, it's like the the uh, what Frank Frank Harrell calls it dichotomania. I, think, mm -hmm. I can't remember if he was the one who came up with that term or not, but that, it's just that sort of unending ability of human beings to put things into boxes and to want to dichotomize things. And I think it is very hard for us to stop and say. You know, I'm I'm not going to make a 100% certain assessment of this particular outcome. I'm going to be willing to live with the uncertainty in it, um, and you know, try to have that propagate through the rest of my decisions in some way. That's very hard to do. Yeah. So we have a question from Amir uh, McCary. Hopefully, I pronounced that name correctly. Uh, relating to the to the tidy bays, and then the question is: the tidy base works with RSTN ARM. As well, and maybe talk about in general the scope of the types of things that it works well with. Yeah, so it does. It currently, so there's a couple of different things in TidyBase. So the stuff that I was showing with add fitted draws, add predicted draws, that workflow works with ERMS and with RSAN ARM. It's it's a bit more of a pain to set up with with individual packages, so I haven't really had a time to do it beyond those two. There are other there's other functionality in tidy bays that's geared at more like stand usage. If you have a stand model where um, you're trying to extract parameters from it and turn it into tidy format data frames, there are these other functions, uh, spread draws and a couple of other things which are designed for essentially taking say a multi-dimensional variable from a stand model and turning it into a long format data frame where each index from the variable becomes a column in the data frame. Which is was actually originally when I was when I was first writing tidy bays I was using uh, I was actually using jags, and so those were the first set of functions that I wrote. Then I switched to stan, and then I started using brms and rsan arm. The latter two have this other workflow with add fitted draws and add predicted draws that builds on top of posterior linfred and posterior predict functions in those packages to be able to generate draws from the posterior predictive conditional on some predictors or the uh, the linear predictor conditional on some predictors. I hope it gives like a the sort of general high level view of them. The the third part of that whole set of things is all of the geometries that GGDIS has within GGplot for doing uncertainty visualization. Those are kind of the three arms to to the packages. Gotcha. Question from uh, Fred Graber. He's asking, what is the name of the package for the probabilistic gram of graphics? Or is there even a, a package like there, that? There is a package, although it's, so it's called PGOG. Um, we don't have it on Crayon yet. It's kind of in that, uh, what I, what I joke, well, I jokingly call it, I borrowed this from one of my advisors during my master's, I call it gradware. It's, so, so it's at that level where, you know, we wrote the prototype for the paper and now we're, we're in the middle of getting some 
uh, programmers on there to turn it into a version where it's well tested enough. Like TidyBase and GGDisk have fairly good test coverage, I think like 90% or something like that. Like the core functionality of those packages should work. And if there's a bug, you should tell me and I'll try to fix it when I have time. PGOG is in that gradware stage where we're still trying to get it to the point where it's reliable for use. So you're, I welcome people to take a look at it, but I, I don't make any representations as to its reliability yet. We do want it to get there. Got it, thanks. So the next question is, I, I think they're gonna murder this name, I'm sorry. You're gonna say Bufong Cow. Thanks for the great presentation. Have you thought about multi-dimensional cases? Uh, let's see, like time series data and things like that. Yeah, so that you can't really see who's just using spaghetti plots. I have some other examples of this with like hops and things like that. There's some good work from a group at, at uh, Utah who do a lot of hurricane prediction stuff where they've looked at time series data. So one of the people to, to look up there would be Lace Padilla. She's actually at UC Merced now. Um, she was a PhD student there, she's graduated. When they they look at things like what they call like representative sampling from high dimensional distribution. So basically, if I want to do something like a spaghetti plot for hurricanes, right, and I want to show you maybe a hundred spaghettis, how do I actually pick that hundred in a way that is representative of the full distribution? But then if you add on top of that in a hurricane context, you also have things like what's the strength of the hurricane, what's the size of the hurricane at those points, you want to be able to draw something that not only is representative of the predicted location, but also all of those other variables. And so that's not something that I've worked on directly, but if you're looking for that kind of thing, you know, I look up Lace Padilla, she's another uncertainty visualization person who's worked on that kind of stuff. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. So Maxim uh, Marishnenko. Miroshnichenko, sorry, as asking, thanks for a great talk. Sort of a short query. What, what about hierarchical models? Is, is there any anything special about like visualizing uncertainty from hierarchical models or like uncertainty is uncertainty? Uh, so that's something that we have, I've definitely had in the back of my mind as a research question to look at, but haven't really had much time to delve into. I think so. I think with hierarchical models, there are interesting questions that go beyond some of the stuff I was just talking about. And, and you know, one of those is if you're both, you, you're like, you're trying to communicate, you could be trying to communicate at multiple levels, like what the uncertainty is for the mean of some group, what the uncertainty is for the variance of some group, then, you know, conditional on someone in that group, what's the uncertainty in some observation from that unit or element of that group. Like there, there are, the, the interesting thing about hierarchical models to me is having these multiple levels to it and then trying to come up with a way of communicating them simultaneously or in a way that people can understand the relationships between them is very difficult. I think, th so this is actually part of the original motivation of, of the probabilistic grammar of graphics was getting it to a point where if we could slice up that distribution and systematically specify, you know, how uncertainty in say the group mean was being encoded and then how uncertainty in at the observation level was being encoded and all the way in between you could start playing with say charts where one of those was encoded as a density and the other one was encoded as hops like animations over those densities or something mm -hmm. uh, or maybe you know what at one level you're using spaghetti plots at another level you're using animation and once you have that then we can start asking these systematic questions like okay you know how do people associate, like, are people able to parse out the uncertainty at one level from the uncertainty at another level if you use these sorts of encodings or if you use these sorts of encodings? I think those are really interesting questions. We're really, right now, I'm trying to lay the, the groundwork to be able to systematically study that type of question. Hmm. I was also thinking, you know, we're often trying to assess the amount of regular, regularization that is induced on some but by some prior, right? So if you, you had some uh, population level variance or whatever, and you crank that down, you kind of want to see how much it regularizes lower lower level parameters. And being able to sort of assess that quickly, it would be really cool, but it's sort of hard to do, right? Mm -hmm. Have you have you sort of thought about that, that doing those kinds of displays or? Uh, I haven't thought about that specific problem, but I, I feel like that's, 
that would be another nice area to apply this kind of stuff to. Yeah, I, I see that connection. I think it, it'd be really neat to to play around with. Cool. Let me ask you, this is my, my sort of personal pet, pet peeve, but I think it's very relative, uh, relevant. And that is communicating on the scale that's important to the decision maker. Uh, and that, of course, is uh, they, they have some kind of a utility. That, that, that utility function is often very difficult to, to elicit. But if we can elicit that utility function, then uh, we can sort of translate the uncertainty into a decision, right? Mm -hmm. Do do you think about things like that? Sort of, do you take it one step further in, into the utility space? What, what 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 do you think is the role of that is in in communicating? So um, yeah, I I love that question because <laughs> I, I I haven't taken it as far as actually trying to translate into the utility space, but I in the in the work that I do right now, we generally. I mean, one of the things that I absolutely detest is things like standardized effect sizes, because I think that they are not useful for people to understand and make decisions from. As you say, you want the data in whatever space people are maybe applying their utility function to, or if you know the utility function, to translate it into that space. And so what we have tended to do in our empirical work lately, try to communicate things in whatever data space we think people are thinking in, and then you know, we might give them a utility function that they that they should be applying to. I think I think like we might incentivize them in a way that determines what utility function they should be applying if we're doing an experiment. Rather than translating it directly into what we think their utility function is, or even the utility function that we provided. And I think part of the reason for that is just the assumption that in the real world we don't know what that utility function is. So we want to be able to figure out how people make decisions if they're given the data in the space that they're thinking about and they have some utility function maybe in their head, right? I think that is an interesting question though. Like if you know the utility function directly translating into it could be useful. I think you still run into the situation where, so Susan Gosselin, who's a psychologist who studies uh, weather forecasting has looked at things kind of related to this where you can, you know, you can tell people what the, best decision is if you know the utility function. But the other thing that you need to be able to do is also gain their trust so that they still listen to you on all of the future times that you're trying to, to tell them what to do. And if you just tell them what the, the right decision is and you don't show them the uncertainty, then when you get it wrong, which sometimes you're obviously going to do, now they might lose trust in your predictions. And so that's where I think you 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 still need to communicate the uncertainty in some way, even if you are trying to, to totally translate it into given everything, this is the decision you should make. Yeah, I think David Spiegelholder calls it tr trustworthiness or something like that, which is definitely a big, a big deal. Great. I think that's all the time we have. Thanks again, Matthew, for coming on. Really appreciate it. I think people enjoyed it. Thanks for um, having me. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> awesome. All right. Take care. We'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.